Uh, social justice. 30 seconds. Hi, this is Paula Gloria, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole because we like to go into topics more deeply. Today, I have the uh, great opportunity uh, to start the first step of, of uh, fulfilling a long-standing uh, dream of mine, which is to understand New York co-ops. And when I had as a guest in past shows, David Casavis, David, thank you for joining me on the show. Absolutely, thank you. When you were running for borough president, you said a few things that really perked up my attention <laughs> about my own individual problem, which is that when I came to New York, I bought an apartment. And I thought that I bought, you know, how you get most real estate. Yes. But I found out it's a very different creature. Absolutely. Can you can you talk about it? And I know that 58 minutes isn't going to be enough time <laughs> because it's huge. You not only understand the problem so well, but you have solutions. So we may not be able to get to them today. So I'll encourage people to stay in tune unless you feel you can give little bits of the problem and then little <laughs> bits of the solution. Okay, okay. Well, let me start by saying the co-op is and is not real estate. It's in a, a class all its own. Uh, co-ops are real estate in that uh, there's a block and a lot. Co-ops are usually located in a building. The building is, uh, has a number of apartments in it. And the block and lot, which means the, the dirt under the building, as it were, is real estate. By so definition. the block is the building, the physical structure? Uh, when we say block and lot, that uh, has to do with the way the city lays out uh. real estate. And everybody's got a block and a lot. You're on a certain block and you have a lot. Some people will use the term, my lot, if you own a house, right. well, that's your lot. Right. And you, that you was work a common a expression in California, but not in New York. Oh, yes. I, I Unless you're running with a you know, well, I went pretty wealthy the, crowd. Well, actually, I went to the Caribbean, and actually, when I went to Guyana and Georgetown, they actually number the, the, uh, the addresses by lot. I thought it was interesting. Oh, yeah. So I think I've seen that in some parts of the world. Oh, absolutely. It's very common. Block and lot is the way we separate right. all real estate, really. Uh, we have meets and bounds, but that's something else that goes back. But uh, you know, they use the term block and lot, or I'm using the term block and lot, to mean the actual dirt under the building, the actual meets and bounds, which means where the, where the, 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 uh, the yard starts and the yard stops. If you can... If you can imagine the average uh, building, you will consider that there's a little lawn in front of it, maybe. Or maybe there's something behind it. It depends what you're looking at. Or there could be nothing. The building can actually be bordered by the sidewalk. And where the building stops uh, is the end of the meets and bounds, the ends of the block and the lot. And that is real estate. Now, most of the time, um, co-ops are not built as co-ops. They're, they're a building that does exist particularly here in New York. A building that does exist, well, implying does ex that a co-op doesn't exist? Well, in a way, a co-op... <laughs> a co building that does exist, that's such a funny expression. Well, when we say does exist, it means it wasn't knocked down, it's not gutted. Uh -huh. you know, sometimes you buy a building, it's four walls. That's it. I, uh -huh. I remember once, years ago, working with the bank, and the bank came up to me, one banker actually looked at me, and I said, well, what's the matter? He says, we just sold uh, a building, but it's not a building. What is it? It's four 100-year-old walls. There's nothing inside. I mean, it was gutted. There weren't even floors. Wow. So sometimes when I refer to a building exists, I mean, it actually has plumbing that works. I see. That has floors in it. I see. And, and all, what happens, particularly here in New York, is somebody owns the building and decides not to be a landlord of the building anymore. And what he should do, what usually happens is, he will turn it into co-ops. And what he does is he separates the apartments from the block and lot, from the real estate. Now, he owns real estate because he owns the building. He owns uh, everything, and you rent from him. But if he decides to turn a building... You don't rent from him. You pay maintenance because you're a part owner, You're jumping right? ahead of me. I'm okay, taking I'm it one step at a time. Okay, okay, okay. Now, let's suppose he wants to uh, change and not be a landlord of the building anymore. Let us suppose he wants to turn it into co-ops. Now, what he can do is separate the real estate from the actual... Um, apartments. And uh, when you want to buy an apartment, you're buying two mortgages. There is an actual mortgage on the dirt under the building, on the block and lot. And then you, you buy Excuse shares. Me, in a co-op or a condo? A cooperative. In a cooperative. In a condo, 
What he can do is turn it into condominium. But if he turns it into condominium, there can be no mortgage on the actual dirt under the building, on the block and So lot. he has to own it free and clear? Own it free and clear. And there, there are ways he can do that. And then he pays taxes to the city for the Well, land? he sells it and he doesn't pay taxes anymore. He takes your money when you buy the, the, co the individual condo. The condo. Let me separate, make a, a okay. real separation. Okay. Here. A cooperative is a business. And when you buy uh, an apartment, you're buying shares in that apartment. And you are also buying a piece of the remaining mortgage on the block and lot. So you really have two mortgages. You're taking a mortgage out, or part of it is out on your percentage of the block and lot, and you're also taking out a mortgage to buy the shares. So there are two pieces involved. Now, this is very important to understand. Right. When you buy the shares, you are part of a corporation. Every building becomes a corporation. Every building. Right. That's a co-op. Not a condominium. I, you know, I don't mean to jump ahead, but just to keep any viewers who think that this is probably not one of my most exciting shows oh, I'm to, sorry to be posted, it. that um, buying those shares, the price that you pay to get your co-op, seems remarkably like trying to buy out people in that sort of blackish market who are sitting on a rent control apartment. That's it seems story. as though you're buying into the privilege of paying rent at a certain value, which you th seem to think is going to be maintenance. It, it looks no. like it's controlled. No. No, it's not. I uh, know it's not. No, it's not. But <laughs> it, you, you get the feeling from when you read up the rules of the co-op that what you're paying is not rent but maintenance. And you go, well, how much could it cost to maintain a place? Well, you're paying two pieces within that. You know, when, when you say right. maintenance, within the maintenance is, is the mortgage the mortgage for the right. dirt under the building. And I'm saying that to make it simple. Right. I mean the, the block and the lot. You're paying right. for that. And then you're also within the maintenance, you're paying for, for a garbage pickup. You're paying for water. Right. You're paying for uh, the elevator. It's, a lot of times there's an elevator in a co-op. Right. And when the elevator breaks down, the co-op has to pay for it. And that the elevator is an expense as well. Right. If you have a doorman, you're right. paying his salary. Twenty-six dollars an hour for a union doorman. Yeah, I, 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 well, I won't get into that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically, I still want to say, um, Progress in Poverty by Henry George, you can come in on this. A hundred years ago, every intellectual knew this book. And he has the simple formula at the beginning of, um, in hard economic times, capital goes down, wages go down, and rent goes up. So it seems as though co-ops is, is really rent. And you have a crisis because people get forced out of their homes. Well, people get forced out of their homes, all right, but I, co I, I wouldn't. Uh, he lived in a time before co-ops, or a time yeah. when co-ops were very, very small. Remember, right. the, the co-ops actually come to us in the early 80s, although they started in the late 70s. and. Uh, on a government policy level, the idea was to have more people owning in New York City, because people who own, it was believed, had more interest in the community and keeping it up than oh, really? people who rent. Oh. It was always that, in part because it was believed that owners would Co-ops or condos? Well, actually both. It had to do with owners. Right. But consider that for New York City, with all the buildings up, a renter's city, it's very hard to convert it, convert it into an owner's city. Right. Consider that many of our buildings have more than 50 units in it. It's very hard to, to, to make that happen. To and own so 50 units. Don't, you know, it, it's much better to have, it was believed to be much better, to have people have an ownership stake. And this goes through the Koch years, if you remember, Ed Koch was uh, No, I don't remember because I'm from Berkeley. <laughs> of course. And we're all 21, so we're too young for that. But, but what happened was uh, the, uh, the, his administration and others wanted to have more owners in the city. And the easiest way was to go the co-op route. Now, you've got to be aware of what co-ops were before and what they are now. Okay. Now, before, co-ops were a very small percentage of the city. Right, the and white they, glove doorman and, yes, and Park Avenue. And, and we still have white gloves. Right, and, 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 and you wanted your neighbor not to be dealing crack cocaine and prostitution right. no matter how much money they made. And officially, what's the definition of a white glove building? What do you have to have to qualify by our New York definition? 
I don't know. Doorman. New York definition is has to be on Park Avenue. Yeah, the doorman has to wear white gloves. The flowers have to be changed on a daily basis. There are a few other odds and ends, but it was very strict, I know, of one building which has those requirements, but I think it's about eight doors away from Park Avenue, and many people, many realtors say, that's really not a white glove building. Uh -huh. So the idea of a co-op being only for a white glove building meant that you had uh, a, a genteel, secure uh, community living in it that would never be pressed to be blunt, for paying. No, no. To be blunt, let's say people like us. <laughs> and actually, I shouldn't, have interrupt. I shouldn't interrupt because you're right. You brought up another topic: people uh, who pay. Because for most white glove buildings that I know of along Park Avenue or along Fifth, they will require, in other words, the co-op board requires that you come up with 75 to 100 percent payment. Right. I'm told some go downhill and say 50 percent payment. But honestly, when you're talking about prices so high. You have to be a certain, uh, You're buying, a certain economic class to pay a million dollars down for a two million dollar co-op. Right. So you're kind of buying into a club. Uh, in that, no, you're buying into a business. Okay. Now, how, business. I didn't see that word in my co-op. No, you didn't. No, you, <laughs> so, you are. So you enlighten own, me. Well, do you own a co-op? I own shares. I you own, own shares. ninety-five shares at twenty-six Gramercy Park South. Okay. Then you are in a business. That's it. And, and, uh, it I want like, some binary economic capital ownership, though. Let me tell you, if I've got a business, <laughs> look, it's like any other business. You own shares, and uh, you have a board of directors. You don't have a board of managers, and and, and those shares. But they usually have a management agent, and you know, an agency that manages for them. Yes, you should, because they have to do a lot of the yada yada. Yeah. You know, part of it has to. They do go with, to court. Trust me, I've seen them in housing court. Yeah, there's a lot that they have to do. And uh, basically, they're employed by you because you own shares. Just as if you own shares in, I don't know, IBM or Westinghouse or any of the major corporations. But it seems as though the board hides behind them. Well, yeah, like they want ages. them to do the work. Many boards don't like meetings. They, they, they find them inconvenient. Most people in most co-ops think of it as if they have an apartment or they have a piece of property in, in the suburbs. You don't. You're part of an active business, and you're supposed to take part in that business. And, and people don't. In, in, in so a, you pay someone to run your business. Essentially. So my question is, who's paying them to run it? Who really you are. owns? Who really owns it? I well, don't feel like an owner. Well, you you have shares. You are a shareholder. Right. And the rights that you have as a shareholder are the rights to live in your apartment. You are not renting. You bought the right to live in your apartment by buying the shares. Okay. When you sell the shares, you sell the right to live in your apartment. That's the way the business runs. I see. Yeah, the only part of real estate that makes it real estate is that there's a piece of your maintenance that's deductible. And whenever you buy in, you should say, uh, what percentage is deductible? Everyone should ask that. And when they say, whatever the percentage is, that's what you can write off. Well, that's the percentage that's real estate. No, I get a little you know, thing at the end of the year that says that. Yeah. Yeah, and ultimately, it's a somebody, minuscule amount of what, what I paid. Yeah. Well, consider when you when you pay on, on your maintenance, you're paying somebody to make sure the city gets its taxes. Right. And that's because it's the real estate part. When you pay a little bit on the maintenance, you're paying somebody to make sure the water bill is is settled. Right. Or in, in most or cases, the, the heat oil is settled. Is paid. The oil is paid, and that somebody's got to be out there when the oil tank or truck comes to put the oil in, in the front of the building. You might notice in the front of most buildings, there's a, a little thing with a cap, and he yeah. takes the cap off and no, puts I the oil in. I talk to those guys and ask, you know, well, how often do you fill it up, and how many gallons is it? I'm doing the math. You're you know? a good owner. You're a good <laughs> owner. You know, what happens with most... I don't know if my board's going to appreciate it in court, though. <laughs> I mean, there's ways to kind of do quick calculations. Sure. I think it's a very profitable business. Well, but I don't feel yeah. like I'm reaping any of the profit or of any not. of the, yeah. You own, don't you? Yeah. So you're not reaping the profits. Right. There are many ways to skin a cat, and there are many ways things can go wrong. So many ways, I don't know if we could cover it in I one program. I know we can't, but let's, I mean, let's try for what we can, and I'll put this out. And, okay. And, and my email, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is rabbitholecentral at earthlink.net. Rabbitholecentral at earthlink.net. And uh, give me your questions. and. In future shows, we'll 
pursue it. Yeah, I tried to lay a background, uh, yeah. trying to give you some no, idea before we get into where the problems are. Right. And some of the problems can be really bad, and some of them can be things you can do nothing about. Right. These peop because people buy in as if they're buying a piece of property, and they feel they're going to have, they're going to handle it, and it can be handled the way a piece of dirt and four walls can be handled. But it's not that way. Right. And there's serious problems. Some are actually small problems. Uh, some are plumbing problems. Now, some people say, well, why do I have to get a plumber that the building says I must get? The building usually has an official plumber, if they're smart. Why? There's a demarcation line. If it goes behind the tile in the bathtub, then it's the building's problem. Well, that's something too. Suppose you take a cheap plumber, he doesn't do a good job, oh, he and the person the downstairs starts getting leaks. Yeah, actually, that, that's happened. Okay, well, that, that's, that's why a smart building says, we have a building plumber, he's the official plumber, he's the one you go to because yeah. he knows what he did upstairs. Right. So those are little problems. Right. There's sometimes big problems, some of which... <laughs> I try to trade apple pies for plumbing. <laughs> anyway, go on. Well, <laughs> well, you know, some of which astound me. What is astonishing? I, I am always astonished when co-op boards, which have bad deals to start with, shoot themselves in the foot. You know, I have cases where uh, co-op boards spend themselves into oblivion. Uh, a good case is the elevator. Now, you've got to understand how elevators are handled with co-ops. Elevators are expensive. You may not think of this, uh, but they need inspection on a regular basis. If you oh, don't yeah. believe that, go look at the wall. Usually there's a, something inside the Oh, I the know. Elevator. I mean, I videotaped inside my elevator. It's very old. It's, it's kind of an antique. It's, it's safe. He convinced me that I would never die. Well, that, that's but fine. Uh, but they won't make them like that anymore. Well, every once in a while, the elevator goes out. It happens. Yeah. Just like a furnace goes out. It might last 35, 40 years, 60 years. I don't know. But when it's gone, it's gone. And that's a big expense. Now, your building might have 100 units in it. Well, that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty big furnace, but right. there might be numerous elevators. What do you do? Now, the nice thing about a co-op is that they can go back to the bank that has the underlying mortgage and borrow the money. And it's an interesting concept which has been awfully abused. The concept, which is a good concept, is you might need, I don't know, $100,000 for an elevator. Maybe you need a million for 10 of them, okay? And you say, oh my gosh, what am I going to do a million dollars? Well, you go to the bank, and the bank sees that the co-op's been paying their maintenance regularly, which means they've been getting their money for, you know. And they'll say, fine. What we'll do is we'll extend the mortgage. And instead of a mortgage of uh, $100 million, it'll be $101 million. Yes. So I'm making up numbers. Yes. And that means everybody pays an extra $2 a month. Right. And they pay $2 a month over 30 years or whatever the life of the elevator. Hopefully the elevator lasts 30 years and then you do it again. Right. But for $2 a month, you know, your elevators are working fine and that way everybody does it and it's not a lot extra. Right. The problem always comes when people push the envelope, when they bother right. borrow more. Right, because you go, gee, $2, maybe I can do four. Yeah, right. And it just keeps going see, that way. See, that's what I was wondering about, and that's why I put Henry George up, is that how come when I bought my co-op in 97 and it had a certain mortgage to be paid, interest rates have gone down, and it should have been paid down after. I figure I've paid about 100000 into it. Oh, okay. So why isn't it less? Why is my maintenance going up? You brought in several issues, so let's start with the sure. easy one. Okay. The easy one is that co-op boards usually see the easy out. And any time anything has to be done, they just say, well, why not $4? Why not $6? And ultimately, the mortgages never get paid off. Now, the co-op board can make a decision. We want the, the mortgage to be paid off. I ran into at least one. Now, if they did get the mortgage paid off at, at the Supreme Court, not the housing court, because what you're dealing with is corporate mismanagement in this case, wouldn't it stand to reason that maintenance would go down if you okay. no longer have a mortgage? Okay, you opened up another question. Now, I want to use this co-op as an example. The co-op decided to pay it off. Now, if you pay it off... I want that co-op on my show. Okay. <laughs> A co-op that has decided to pay their mortgage, yay. And, and they, I understand they came close. I, I uh -huh. haven't spoken with them in a while. If they pay it off, 
you can do what many co-ops think they want to do, continue as a co-op without any uh, mortgage part of their maintenance. So you're always going to pay for garbage and, and, and mm -hmm. water yeah, right, and heat. Right. And uh, that would be fine. This co-op decided to uh, become a condo. Now you can become a condominium when there's, you're free and clear. The block and lot is owned free and clear. And then what you could do is you file the papers, you do the legal work to become a condominium. Condominiums behave differently. Now you can buy and sell your, it's property, you can buy and sell your... Uh, you're, you're under real estate law. Yeah, under real right. estate law you can buy, and, and taxation is that way. You have board of managers, not a board of directors. You're not a business anymore. I, I still want to plug Henry George on this because he said that you see vestiges of this understanding of monopoly and giving access to resources to the common person in real estate law. So it's, it's understood that if monopoly gets too strong and rent gets too high, you're, you're killing the society. Well, just remember, you are part of a business. You're not a property owner. Yeah. I think Henry George would say that uh, freedom and independence in our entire way of life is based on people who own a little piece of property and protect it. Mm -hmm. You don't own a little piece of property. You're part of a business. He would point to you and say, you are the business owner. You are the oppressor. Because remember, this comes from before his time. And it comes from... Not if you don't own the land. You don't own the land. You own shares. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, you are a business. You, it's like owning shares. But how shares. come you can't control your business? That's what Can I'm you saying. control Westinghouse? Suppose you bought shares in Westinghouse. Suppose you bought shares in Con Edison. Do you think they're going to listen to you? It's the same thing. You have a right to vote? Yeah, but percentage-wise. You have a hefty percentage of what... The of what the entire thing is. Of Con Edison? No, I don't think no, so. Con, no, let me tell you, this I know for sure because I've been schooled by Robert Ashford. When Con Edison or any big corporation wants to grow bigger and they need capital to do it, they don't sell stock to do it. They go to uh, corporate lenders and they borrow based on the earnings of future capital of what the business produces. Yeah. But when you're living in a house, that's not really a business. You're not producing anything. Well, that's true, but you can take a second mortgage. No, I know, but... But, but you but, can't. But, but what I'm saying is what Robert Ashford was saying is people say, well, binary economics doesn't work because if you own something, how come there's all of this uh, mortgage disaster? And he's saying that's because you haven't owned part of a business that's creating something. Okay, the mortgage disaster is another story. I know, I know this because 25 years ago, I actually, actually was working at a bank next to the people who actually started it out. So I followed it from the very beginning. That's another story. Yeah. That has to do with real estate. Your conundrum is co-ops, which is a business co conundrum, and you don't have more uh, weight or say than the number of shares you own. And if you're going to vote, you vote by your shares. If you have 10 shares... Yeah, but the idea is, is that if you go into the whole co-op and you inform all your fellow occupants, that, I mean, I was actually told this in housing court, you know, the, the, the lawyer that was trying to settle yes. with the judge sort of under his breath goes, you know, this is a democracy. You can get together with all the people, because his eyebrows went up when he heard how much maintenance I was paying for of the square course. footage. Why and he am said, I not surprised? <laughs> and he said, you can get together. I mean, we're Greek, right? We know the democratic spirit, aletheria, freedom, and, and control your destiny. And you can say, with the momentum of shares, you can say, I want something okay. different. Let me start by saying it's not a democracy, it is a business. You own shares. You have as many votes as your shares are. And you can, can get other shareholders together. Right. And then you will be... Uh, you'll have votes the way anyone would in a corporation. Right. If you own shares, right. people sometimes ask for you to vote. Sometimes they'll, no, no, they'll here's, send here's you a letter in the no, mail. No, here's what I'm trying to say, David. When they go to get the mortgage for the co-op, yes. they're not giving the bank shares, are they? No. So that means the shares are still evenly distributed among all the shareholders. No? There's preferential no, no, shares? No, 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 no. There are two types of loans, and you're mixing them up. Okay. There is a loan to the co-op, which is a loan on the block and lot. It's a loan on oh, the real estate. And that's really the landlord. That's who's why then I tried to running make the business of the co-op. Yeah, and shares yeah, absolutely. And Generally, the landlord takes a mortgage out before he gets started. 
and then and that's the mortgage right. you inherit, and the you divide the pieces up each by each share, each share pays a percentage of the mortgage. If you have a hundred shares, let's say, and the, the, each share may be one percent of the mortgage that is left over by the landlord, that's another way you get cheated that nobody understands. Let me explain. I'm a landlord, let's say. Okay, let's say I own a building. I want to go to Florida. Maybe I want to become an orange. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so I got a million dollars underneath this co op. I've got 200 apartments. Okay. I want to sell those apartments. A million dollars underneath it means the land is worth a million? Yeah. The, no, the, no, my mortgage is a million. Your mortgage. The land may be worth much more. Right. But my mortgage, sometimes mortgages and what you own have nothing in relationship with each other. That's why we've got foreclosures. I see. Okay. So let's suppose I've got a million dollars, I've got 200 apartments, and I decide I can make more money selling these apartments out. I want to get a pair of sunglasses and roast on the beach in Florida, right? Okay. What am I going to do? I'm going to sell them. So what I do is I get some uh, smart real estate agent, maybe, and I say, here's 200 of them. Anybody lives here, you want to buy your own apartment, here's the deal. Now, uh, th this brings another piece into it where you have to have people who want to stay on as tenants. But I want to right. jump forward to where you get ripped we, off. We had that in my building. Yeah, so it I, seems that's as, another as, issue. as they let die me, off, then they're adding more to the value. Well, that's another issue. I'd so, like to cover that yeah, later. But let I me know. talk about how you get ripped off, if and you again, don't ra mind. Rabbitholecentral at earthlink.net for questions for the next shows. Okay, okay. One of the ways people get ripped off is, let's suppose I managed to sell, I don't know, 50 apartments. Got 150 left, and I sell them for I don't know. Let's say I sell them for ten dollars an apartment, and I got a million dollars underlying mortgage. Then I say, well, wait a minute now. I go to the bank and say, look, I've been selling these for I don't know, ten dollars. It's ridiculous. Can I borrow some more money? Bank smile. Yeah, sure. How about a million dollars? Bank gives me a million dollars. Now I got a million dollars. I didn't have to sell to another 150 people. I got a million dollars now. And you're the one stuck with a mortgage. And you're not really stuck until we got a, a majority, until we handed it all over. I still own the building, right? Maybe I haven't closed it. So I take the million dollars, good. I take the million dollars, I go, to, I go to Florida. Well, instead of charging you, say, $10, from now on I'll charge you $5. And it looks fine because your maintenance goes way up, but what you're paying looks cheap. So people come and say, oh, I'm going to buy something cheap. So watch if the maintenance is high. Okay, then maybe I'll do that and go to Florida. Well, suppose I'm really greedy. I said, gee. I I suppose you want to go to Cuba. Or yeah, so what about, suppose I want to buy a country, buy my own island. I said, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> go back to the bank and say, hey, you gave me a million bucks. It's good. Can you give me two million? Oh, by the way, where, the wherever you go, Rabbit Hole Central or, or farther down the rabbit hole can be seen streaming live on MNN.org, Channel 34, anywhere in the world on the Internet, if you happen to sell out and, this is why you and buy your, your country or island. <laughs> uh, let me just say, suppose you get two million for it. Now instead, I'll charge you four dollars for an apartment instead of five. Well, you know, I even instead of five, five dollars. I charge you ten dollars, and I had a million dollars underlying mortgage. But I took a million. I don't have to worry with about you. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to hire a big real estate agent. I got a million bucks, and maybe I do what one of the, 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 the landlords did. He had a million dollar underlying mortgage. He took seven million out. So the I don't want him on. From, I don't want him on my show. Well, let show. me explain what happens. The mortgage goes from one to seven, right? He takes six million dollars. He hires a kid. Says, "Look, you're a kid. You got a license. Just get rid of these apartments, and we'll we'll make them so dirt cheap, everybody will come." So the kid says, "Fine." Guy takes the money. He skips. He skipped to Florida. This guy, and he's a good example because I've run into other people who skipped. They don't all go to Florida, but that's where he went. And you know. But excuse me, how can you skip if you own the underlying land? You don't oh, the own bank it owns anymore. It you own it. He doesn't own it. You own it. Because it's a condo? Because it's a co-op, and you were foolish enough to buy one. But I thought you don't own the land. No, you're stuck you know, You're stuck with a percentage you of own the, the mortgage. underlying mortgage. Right, okay. So you're stuck with a percentage not of $1 million, but a percentage of $7 million. So your basically, the whole thing can go into the crap. Your right? maintenance and just went up already... seven times right. and you just started. And all of a sudden you say, why is my maintenance going up? Well, because the fellow who owned the building, who converted it over, kept taking the money out. Right. And he can do that because he's selling it. It's his product. 
That's what he did, and he's gone. And then all of a sudden, everybody's saying, gee, why is the maintenance so high? That's one trick. Now all of a sudden, everybody has enormous maintenance, and they say, well, my mortgage is, are, is small. Well, your mortgage on the shares is small, right. but you gotta pay that off. Right. You know, there, there are other things that happen to, my God, I mean, People actually, and I'm thinking of one building, the people just walked out. They said, forget it. And, you know, you've got to cover that. They just walked away from They there. walked, yeah. And you've got to cover that. Now, if you don't have people Unfortunately, who, well, unfortunately, fortunately, I live in a very desirable area. It's historical, it's charming, it's beautiful, and it just keeps going up. Of course, it's a good car. It's a good target a for target. scams. A and there are plenty of scams. Target Look, for scams. Wow, let, that let doesn't seem to, very genteel and grammar I'm trying to explain. Okay, there's, yeah. there's one on the Upper East Side I know of. I won't identify it. But there Nice was to a, see your Greek passions coming. Yeah, well... You know, and, and by the way, rabbit hole central at earthlink.net, yeah. uh, because you have solutions. Yeah, so, there are so solutions we're, we're in the, the, the passion part. Look, I'll give you a, another problem we had with the stores. You know, some co-ops have stores underneath because their mm -hmm. the buildings with stores made sense. And what the, uh, what the owner did was uh, he, he only finagled with the mortgage a little bit. Instead, what he did was he took all the stores and had long leases on the stores. And he only charged a little bit, maybe a dollar <laughs> something for the store. <laughs> and he saw to it that somebody got the lease for a dollar for maybe 20 years. And he, he took some money. He made sure that he got paid a lump sum up front. And he can do that because he owns the building, which means he owns the stores too. And he made sure they paid him so that their lease would way up a, a lot up front. So their lease would be, I don't know, a dollar or some ridiculously small amount. And when the co-op took over, the co-op then got the income from the lease. But the incomes from the lease were about that small. So the co-op didn't get the kind of money it hoped to get from the stores, which means the maintenance had to go up to cover the underlying mortgage. That was another trick. It was another way to gild the lily. So there are a lot of things. When you look at a co-op, you got to look at a lot of things because you're buying well, a what's, business. What's our government doing? Because when I looked over my tomes of, mm -hmm. uh, of rules and regulations when I bought it and thought, oh God, God, I'm never going to read this. You know, now I read it like a detective novel. Mm -hmm. um, what the uh, New York Attorney General? I can't remember who it was then. He, he just sort of has a disclaimer at the beginning, kind of like, this may be the most important investment of your life. And I thought, you know, I've made much bigger investments, so I didn't, you know, big deal. It wasn't that money, that much, like you say, it was actually quite cheap. Um, can't they do more to protect the citizens than, than put a disclaimer, this may be the most important investment of your life, buyer beware? Well, let me start by saying they'll say that with any house or any home, which is true. Yeah. Most people buy a home, and that's the most important investment of their lives. Right. Now, what do you want the attorney general to do? I mean, well, people, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem um, that the interests of the shareholders <laughs> are being protected. If it's well, a business. <laughs> well, there's also a clause saying buyer beware, and most people walk into co-ops with their eyes closed. They have no idea what they're getting into. Of course not, because they own the land. You want to live somewhere. You want to live in Manhattan. You don't have a choice. This is where you want to live. It's yeah. like Microsoft saying, do you accept this or do you not accept this program? You, you, you have to accept. What else is there? You're going to get a Linux system or be some kind of, you know, underground hacker? You well, know? you could rent or you could examine the terms closely. Now. Co-ops are not rentals, and when you go into a co-op and you're looking to buy one, consider Excuse that... Excuse me, you could rent. I'm really wanting to think this through because when I got in, it was 160000 which is so cheap today. They're, they're going for half a million. Oh, yes, many are. Um, but the, uh, the, the rent control people were probably paying four or $500 a month. Yes. And now they pay twenty-five. Yeah, and they're not moving out. You're no, paying twenty five dollars a month? That's great. No, no, not twenty five. Two thousand five hundred. Month where monthly rent control people are The rent zone. control people die off and then the co op rents out these for hire. Sure. And I would think that goes into the coffers that then should be divided among the shareholders. Well, 
or to pay down the mortgage or, you know. What, what happens is, Isn't that is, corporate no, good management? We've got to take this one step at a time, yeah. okay? If a person is paying $500 a month, say they're paying a dollar. Rent right? control. A dollar, okay, and let's say the apartment sold is worth $100 and uh, the co-op, the person dies, so the person is only paying a dollar. The co-op owns the apartment, which means the co-op has been paying the maintenance on that uh, apartment. All of you have been paying a share of the maintenance of that apartment because it gets divided up. It's just your maintenance. Now, once the apartment is sold, it's a different story. Now, you can sell the apartment, and let's say the apartment's worth $100, okay? Uh, you can take the $100, you have 100 apartments, you could divide it up, but usually the co-op co will use it to retire some of the debt. It's up to the co-op as a group. Yeah, retire the it's debt, a business. that's good. That's good, I you like could, retiring you reti debt. You, yeah, you could retire debt. I know co-ops that say, oh boy, we have this money, why don't we, uh, why don't we pay for an awning? Why don't we uh, pay for a club up on the, on the roof? I mean, there are a lot of things they can do, and that's why where good business management comes uh, into play. The co-ops should have good business managers. Most effective co-op You mean after the guy's gone to Florida? Yeah. This is, yeah and the gone, kid's grown up and he's gone to Harvard he's, Business School and yeah, he knows how to a, be a good business manager? Yeah, he's got a suntan. He doesn't care. He doesn't know anymore. But he's out of the picture. He's out of the picture. But, you know, most successful co-op presidents will tell me, uh, you will hate me, but I'll do a good job. I don't, I don't think, of, I can't think of a single successful good president that I know That's that wasn't liked. hated by somebody that, and that was widely liked. But when they step out of the position, they are liked because they realize what this person has done. Because ultimately, people argue with each other. I mean, some co-ops are so large that they have a percentage of rent controlled people or rent regulated people still in the building and uh, they have representatives on the board or they try to represent them to the board so the, the board isn't just dealing as a business but it's dealing as a business that has to deal with renters sometimes that happens now in answer to your question probably the best thing to do would be to sell it in a good market take the money and then use it to either to retire the debt or something else uh, some co-ops decide to rent the apartment sell out. Sell it? it yeah, oh, you could I sell see. it or you could rent so, it. So some good business, business co-op managers or boards decide to sell it? The boards make the decisions. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's a collective you when I say you rent it, you sell it. It's Boy, not you'd you really, as an individual. you'd really pay down the, the mortgage because you're talking about an escalated value of five times. There's always a danger in paying down well, the mortgage. Times. Okay, what's that? And the danger is that you get a co-op board that decides to borrow even more money now that there's no mortgage. Let's take out a new mortgage. And they put you back into the cycle. That's why the board I'm thinking of... Oh, you of, mean, so you want to keep it a little a little bit around. Well, the board I'm thinking of is interested in becoming a condominium so nobody can do this. I mean, it's the same problem you have in any business. So, excuse me, with a condominium, it's every man for himself? You can only uh, borrow yeah. your little inches yeah, of it's your, Manhattan it's, yeah. dirt? It, yeah, that's what it is. Remember, co-ops are for, um, for people like us. So every, one of the advantages of having the business is you can only have certain people move in. And uh, for instance, I knew one co-op, this goes back many years, was all Korean. They only wanted Koreans living in the building. So it legalizes a, a form of prejudice. Uh, that, but My, the condos, you our, can't do that. Our rule said you couldn't do that. You couldn't discriminate well, for it's up to the sexual co stuff. And if the co-op wants to make those rules, they can. Oh, they, so they can be like a club that Groucho Marx wouldn't join because yeah, they'd could, have him as, as a tenant? You could, you could do almost anything that <laughs> way. I mean, you could require that everybody owns a duck. It doesn't <laughs> matter. You know, I mean, oh, speaking, I, know, yeah, I know of one co-op that didn't want people of color in it. Well, I, had a, I had a Chinese business partner, Chinese descent, and when he was trying to get rid of a tenant he didn't like, and rather than go through court and stuff, he would just move his mother-in-law in. This is in San Francisco with her chickens <laughs> that would crow in the morning, and the people would leave. And was this a, a condo, a rental, or co-op? I don't know. He hates condoms. He said he'd never live in a condom himself. He said that's yeah. the official abbreviation in the U.S. government's condom. Yeah. Traditionally in the business, when you talk about condos and you want someone to buy a co-op, you can say, 
what if the next door neighbor is a hooker and she has men over all the time? You can't stop that in a condo, but you can in a co-op. Give you an example, downtown close to New York University. I know of a very nice co-op. I worked with the building. They won't allow students to buy anything, or they won't allow prospective parents of prospective students at New York University to own an apartment. Oh, you Why? mean they see if the kids they, are becoming you, of college age and they won't let they them They won't in? let them, especially if they think wow. they're going to go to New York University. If they're going to go to any other university, fine. There is a reason. Uh, there are a number of students. You mean they ask their SAT scores? <laughs> well, that is nosy, nosy. <laughs> no, there, there's a very practical reason for it. The, uh, they have a number of, of one bedrooms and, 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 and studios. What the parent usually does is try to buy one of the studios and say to the kid, you're going to live in here for the four years you go to New York University. When you're out, you can stay and get a job. But when you get married or when you want to move out of New York City, that's when I'm going to sell it. And many parents bought it so it would appreciate. So they'd pay for the college education? Yes. I see. Now, why does the co-op not want this? The co-op did not want this because they didn't want to have frat parties in their apartment. You know, I hate to break this to you, but young ladies and young men of the age of 20 or 21 like to have keggers, which means they bring the keg into the apartment, and you can imagine what happens. Yeah. So there's an argument on both sides, but it gives you an idea of why the co-op behaves the way it does and why right. people are uh, uh, like co-ops. Some people actually like co-ops for that reason. Right. They like the exclusivity and... Well, they also don't want you renting the co-op out, except right. under specific terms. You right, can't do this right. with a condo. Right. I know a number of businesses that buy condos here. I'm thinking of one Chinese business years ago, sold them a condo. They were very happy. What did they do? They, they used to have to come to New York for business, and they always had their, uh, their workers come to stay in that condo. And it actually saved money over uh, having, having to rent uh, hotel rooms. So they always had the condo, and they always had somebody regulating the condo, you know, knowing who was coming and going. Right. That worked for them. Mm -hmm. So there, there are many reasons why people prefer a condo. And also, because of that, condos tend to be worth more money, which is another reason why the co-op I was mentioning would rather become a condo by paying everything down. Uh, and, and because there, with, with that kind of flexibility, People tend to pay more money. Or corporations can buy, and it's fine. I know very few corporations. Corporations buy, buy condos so they can put their out-of-town guests or people in there. Yes, they precisely. Want. Yeah. I know very few so co-ops like is, that. It is more like a hotel, then, isn't it? It can be. Especially I, you know, I kind of like the co-op quietness. I have to admit. I just, I'm just very concerned about this. What you called grabs before. Yes, grabs. You know, we have a saying in the business, a landlord is usually happy with one grab, which is to say he could do more to you. So if he does one thing to you, expect it, but be happy he doesn't do two things to you. Uh -huh. This is the way life is. Right, right. Yeah, I was trying to explain all the little Well, now, where do you, where do you think, um, you know, when there are problems, which courts should be handling this? Just your gut. Should it be housing court or a Supreme Court? Uh, it, it's a business. Anywhere a business goes, that's where you should go. Than that Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah, there's always pro there have always been problems with. Uh, but they're putting it in housing court, you know, and they call it landlord tenants, and I, you know, keep saying it, but I'm a shareholder. Well, let's say you're a rent controlled or rent regulated person in an apartment in a building. It has to be landlord tenant. The landlord yeah, no, is you, that. the shareholder, yeah. and whoever represents you. If you want to go in and complain, there are things you can complain about, but. Uh, I really think a lot of this is, is it's business oriented. That's what it was meant to be. So again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for questions for David Casavis, Rabbit Hole Central at Earthlink.net. And I don't know how much time in control room. How much time do we have? And if you have any questions in the control room, fourteen minutes. Fourteen minutes. Okay. Do you want to go over some solutions or? Have you outlined the problem? Well, yeah, let me, let me start by, let, sure. let me talk about some of the problems that occur. You can have individual problems that are uh, truly uh, peculiar to your apartment. I'll give you an example. There is uh, one 
co-op up the street from me, and a lady was selling her, her apartment, and the maintenance was very high, and higher than anything else. Like how much per square foot? Oh, it was about, oh gosh, it was about three times the the square footage price. What, what is other, an average condo square foot price? Oh, that depends on the market. I mean, honestly, uh, uh, we break it down to uh, price, uh, tax per square foot, maintenance per square foot. The first thing you should ask is, what's the maintenance per square foot? I see. And by the way, almost every co-op I've run into is overpriced. So how do you Google that maintenance per square foot to find out what that figure is? The, I, in the industry standard, that must be a standard, right? No, there's no standard. But there isn't a standard. No, co-ops are about privacy. I've had, I can't tell, <laughs> no, I can't tell you. No transparency. Oh. It doesn't sound cooperative. No, no, I can't tell you the number of corporations from out of town that have wanted to build and have called me up and asked me to do uh, contract work for them. And they want to pay pennies for the job. The first thing I say is, it's an enormous job and I don't even know if I can do it. I don't think anybody can do it. It's just the way it is. What are they wanting done? Uh, they want to know how much they can get for building a, uh, a cooperative. And they want to know what the maintenance is on average Oh, they're, the they're, average they're doing a breakdown cost analysis yes. versus uh, income potential. And, all yeah, and you can't do it. You can't do it because all of this has been kept secret for years. But it's kept secret because it goes back 100 years, 100 That's years true. ago. That's true. When I looked at my original uh, paperwork, it had been a 99-year lease yes. prior to that. I mean, the people who bought con co-ops many, many years ago were the people who belonged to private clubs. I mean, these are people, this actually goes back to a time when you, you couldn't find out statistics on stock companies. I mean, serious, the Standard & Poor's actually started out just trying to give you the information on companies so you knew whether you were going to get ripped off or not, because nobody even knew who the board of directors were. If you, you bought what year a, was that that Standard & Poor's did that? Oh, this goes, I think, that. actually, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it goes back to the 1870s. Uh -huh. And they, I think they, they, from what I remember, they, they, it's a, they met on a train and they were talking about it and realized there was a business in just telling you who was on the board of directors. I think the time has come for some consciousness to go into New York co-ops. Well, uh, the, the question... Hasn't the pendulum swung far enough? Uh, I, Are know. people frustrated enough? And oh, yeah. It? There's plenty of frustration out there. <laughs> yeah. you know, look, it's, it, once you buy a co-op, you're actually entering into a world, uh, a rarefied world, of very wealthy people. But the people who have purchased into co-ops for the last 25, 30 years are not that. They're just average schmoes. Right. Many of them. Who are losing jobs. Yeah. Well, many of them are out-of-towners. They're from the Midwest. They're from the South. They, they understand. Right, right. New York's becoming kind of a tourist town, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, that's another, that's that's another, another issue. issue yeah. Because I, I've noticed many, many people from Europe want to buy something here, but they prefer condominiums. That's part of the reason that the value is so good in Gramercy Park. The, the euros are stronger. The currency abroad is stronger. Well, that's another issue that does happen. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. we see that. They, they like that charm. It looks like a mm. London park. Yeah, we've seen that more in Hawaii because when the yen was strong, Japanese came to buy because they love Hawaii. That is true in New York, too. You have two groups of people who came in over the last, oh gosh, 15 years. Uh, many more European buyers and many Californian buyers who wanted to be by coastal And when they insist on condos, they took up a percentage of apartments that were already small. So they forced the price of condos up. Right. And that was years ago, and it continues to grow Mine's higher. Mine's 322 square feet. It's unbelievable. It's like a closet. Yeah, that's... Uh, you know, yeah. and it's almost $1,000 a month maintenance. Well, traditionally... That's why I was asking you what the square foot average maintenance is. Well, on the east side, traditionally, 450 was a uh, L-shaped studio and 300 was the smallest studios, the type that you find in Tudor City. They were, original, they were the original studios. I don't know what studios. Tudor City is. Well, Tudor City is a few blocks away from where you live in Gramercy Park. Oh, really? I it, overlooks, yeah, it overlooks um, the UN, and it's uh, 
it was, uh, I think it was about eight buildings. But I think they claim it's bigger because they measure outside walls and then they measure the well, trash area that's and then another they measure the hallway. And I'll be glad to explain it in detail, <laughs> but that's another, that's another program. When it yeah. comes to Tudor City, uh, I think it's interesting because Tudor City was meant to be a pied de terre. Right, I like pied de terre. That's what I bought this was as a pied de terre when I had money. Yeah, studio, studios were meant to be that way. They're very small in Tudor City, but they are the original pied de terres. Tudor City, Tudor City is built around 1928, maybe 1926. Excuse and me, for the viewers that aren't speaking French, pied de terre means a place to put your foot when you're yeah. out of town. In American English, it's your stomping grounds. That's <laughs> okay. what it is. And you know that it, if you think about it, people who bought co-ops going back many years. But stomping sounds like two feet. A pied is just like one little foot. <laughs> The but, French are so elegant. Uh, yeah. Well, that was kind of a step up from years ago when people had clubs. Uh, you still have clubs in New York City which have a hotel component. And it used to be that you lived in the countryside and you came into the city at a time when c commuting wasn't as convenient. And you left your family at home and you lived in the apartments that you rented above your club. So it was a hotel situation where you paid and mm -hmm. you were a member of a club. You still have clubs in the city like that. Now what they do is they're part hotels. So you still have the club element, but they make most of their money off of being a hotel. And they tend to be a little cheaper than a normal hotel room. But that's what you did. You left your family at home. If you go back, there was a point when uh, uh, during the summer, men stayed here all summer in Manhattan and worked in a sweltering environment without air conditioning and their wives and children went out to Long Island. And there's even an Al Jolson song, it was a hit in 1910, which is said, the song is, Hooray, my wife has gone away for the summer. And the men actually enjoyed it because they spent long nights playing poker, smoking cigars, and drinking whiskey. And, th and sweating. They, and sweating. And nobody complained. Well, you know, when you don't have air conditioning, whiskey helps. And <laughs> what they would do is they'd go out to visit their wives in the fresh air in Long Island, along the beach. Mm -hmm. And to this day, we still have people who go to the Hamptons, although it's not the same setup that we had before. In a case like that, you might live in a club. You might live upstairs, you know, above the club. Uh, and what you had later on was you had more people wanted co-ops because it was a little more convenient. It was worth buying something. And then you had people who bought co-ops as pied de terres. Now you have a situation which I would say changed, as I said before, the late 70s to the early 80s. That was the change where people were buying their apartments and actually living here as families. So it's, it's just an evolving city. Uh, I don't know how much further it will evolve. I don't, I don't see into the future seeing things changing much. But I do see the city as becoming more like a European city. If you look at European cities, let's say Paris, for example, the rich people live in central Paris. The poor people live in the suburbs. I just love the, uh, the what is it, the slang for the suburbs? They call them the red suburbs. The when, red? The red suburbs. And they've called them that, gosh, I think since the late 1870s. Why? Uh, there was uh, uh, the Communard Revolt. The communists? Communa so the they communists not, live in the suburbs? They, yes, sir. They were not known as communists at the time. They were known as communards. And if you look at New York newspapers from the time, whenever they were anti-communist, uh, they were not anti-Bolshevik, they were anti-French communard at the time, because it's before the Russian Revolution. And that's when, uh, the, the, after the revolt, uh, the working people tended to move to the suburbs. So the European cities, and I'm using Paris as an example, developed where there were wealthier people in the city. You know, I had a city planner who now is uh, the head of city planning at Rutgers University. And he says that in New York, there's a lot of creative housing that people will share spaces so that there's actually ways that poor people, artists, you know, can uh, survive in the city that they couldn't survive in the suburbs. They, w they don't need a car here. You know, oh, yes. there's a lot of. Oh, yes. It certainly makes the, the culture more diverse and rich to have all incomes. Well, well a few bits about that. Uh, from a technical point of view, I, I, I sold a co-op uh, a, a co to an artist once. Worked out very well. And she got a studio for something like, uh, I think, under $100 a month. 
And there are places you can go to with studios where you can actually work and then go home to your studio apartment. And it, it's very reasonable, so that's possible. Is that possible today? Oh, absolutely. Today? Yeah. You but get which, maintenance of $100 a month? It's not maintenance. It's just having your own studio. You don't live there. You paint there. Oh, you paint there. You paint you there. Don't you live there. Ceramics, whatever you do. And uh -huh. I think that's fair. Then you go home. Uh, that's an old <laughs> concept. Why? Well, it's an old concept. It goes to the term allotment. And we still have it here in the city. An allotment, if you want a, if you, you want a farm, if you want a garden. Forty uh, acres and a mule, it's kind well, of like that equivalent for artists? I think you couldn't handle like, 40 acres and have a full-time job. I know, 40 inches and a paintbrush it's, kind of thing. Well, yes, yes, because the allotment, which we still have here in the city, you can actually apply for an allotment. You get a small piece of ground and that you can plant whatever you want, vegetables or something. Some people build little shelters for the rain. And that's their backyard. And they oh, travel yeah. from wherever they live to their backyard. I know because I, uh, for a while, when the I moved. The little community gardens, you mean? Uh, the that's a different thing. They're like the allotments. They can be the allotments. Some allotments are community gardens. That's really wonderful. So Isn't you, that, that, doesn't that encourage community and? Well, I like allotments. Community gardens, I'm question, I question about. they too for you? Well, because community gardens tend to take, be taken over. And allotments, you have oh. your little piece. Everybody has their little piece. And everybody's happy together. So okay. I always stick to the formal term. I'm just, maybe I'm a little too formal for that, but I think it's good. But that's what I was explaining, uh, uh, comparing right. what the artists do. Because the artists actually can have a little place to paint, but the thing is you have to leave your apartment and go there. And I think it's much healthier than staying in your apartment and painting alone, because if you're alone right. all the time, you can right. get mighty strange. Right, right. But it's nice to right. know that you're in a community of artists and all of you have a little a way to paint. Now there's another element to that, and the other element is it's, very, minute? Okay. it's very good to have a neighborhood of mm. artists. Uh, such mm -hmm. as we had in Soho, but look what happened to Soho. Anytime you have a neighborhood of artists, uh, it's Prices amazing. Prices go up and the yeah. artists go out. All these rich people who have too much money <laughs> start going in and pushing the artists out. That's why I'm more in favor of the artists having studios in places where they go to than they go home. David, it's really been wonderful to have you as a guest and to just sort of feel a part of Manhattan community television, yeah. you know, that, that through the television we create our community. That's why it's called Manhattan Neighborhood yeah. Network. And you've just been a wonderful neighbor. I've really enjoyed working with you when you were running for borough president. Yes. And I look forward to viewers uh, emailing me, rabbitholecentral at earthlink.net, and I'll pass your comments on to David and we can develop what the viewers have to say. Wonderful being here, thank you. Yeah, thanks David. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, be sure to pick up uh, your copy of Progress of Poverty. You can get it for a mere $10 at the Henry George School, which is on 30th Street and Park. It's also Social Problems, nice hardbound copy. Again, for only $10 because it's underwritten by the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. I think uh, the Robert Schockenbach could, uh, could get involved with a lot more solutions. You think not much is going to change, but I think if we put a little energy into it, maybe we could see creativity spring up in that neighborly kind of way. From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you in the control room. That's a wrap. Thanks. No. Thanks. I hope I didn't interrupt you too much. Not at all. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Okay. But I, it's fine. Well, I this. Just, I just wanted to.